Why are there giants in Nephilim after the flood? I think this is a very intriguing and important question to ask when we're having conversations about Enochian mythology, right? And for several reasons, right? One of those reasons is because one of the reasons for the flood, according to Enochian mythology, you know, based off of Genesis 6 and, you know, the first book of Enoch and the book, other books that are within the Apocrypha, right? I don't know all of them, right? That within texts that talk about, uh, within the biblical scope, within texts that talk about the watchers, the 200 watchers sleeping with women and creating a race of Nephilim and giants and mighty men of renown, that the reason for the flood was because of the things that took place with the giants, with the what I see as genetic splicing, with the uh, watchers teaching things to people. And I'd see the watchers kind of like the Anunnaki, right? Now, one thing to understand is this, why were giants still uh, in the Old Testament beyond the point of the flood? Right? Now, some people will say, well, they just don't know where giants come from, so they'll just say they're just there. There's no explanation for it. But I believe that there are a few different theories and explanations and ways of looking at this particular conundrum, right? There's a few different ways of looking at it. Now, one way of looking at it is the theory that maybe some of them were just so tall that they went to the highest peak of a mountain and they stood over because they say some made it up to 450 feet. But let's say that some of them uh, went to the highest peak of a mountain and they just survived. All right now, if we're talking about the book of giants, then with that theory, there would be a matter of in the book of giants that of some of the Nephilim were given dreams, uh, and within these dreams that they were given, some of them had a capacity to repent and to. You know, change the way they were looking at things, change the way they were doing things, and they were able to survive the flood. I'm not sure if that's the case. I think that the flood wiped out most of what's there, if not all of it. You get what I'm saying? But I'm sure there may be exceptions here and there. Now, that particular theory is different from the taller ones on a peak of a mountaintop theory, because within this theory, there's actually a change in the view of seeing every single Nephilim or giant as inherently evil. But I think we do have to understand that when it came to the knowledge that they were given by their parents, right? And also when it came to the fact that they were just so much larger, right? So much larger than the average human that it would take them a lot of food in order to sustain themselves. So if they ever went through a drought or a famine in, then they would end up becoming cannibals towards themselves, drinking blood, eating raw meat, you know what I mean? Eating people alive, eating each other alive. And there was that civil war that took place before the flood that whittled down the numbers a good bit. Right? But that doesn't explain why they were there, right? So those are two theories, right? Now, another theory when it comes to why they are there after the flood is this, uh, the idea of a second incursion. Now, I do not believe that there is a second incursion. Like we do have to create a distinction between fallen angels, which I would consider like the aliens or interdimensional beings, and what we consider the watchers, which would also be aliens or interdimensional beings or angels, right? But the 200 watchers got thrown into Tartarus. I believe that the price was so grave for the first incursion, which established this race of Nephilim that pretty much perverted the entire world. 
that I don't think any of them were dumb enough to make that decision again. Like, yes, the ones who are falling may have the same long term destination. But think about how uncomfortable it is for Sam Jaza or Sammy Aza, right, to be in the, you know, under the earth, to be under rocks in a dark, jagged place. I'm sure that they wouldn't want to have that same uh, level of repercussions on the wait up until Judgment Day. So I don't think that there is a second incursion. Now, this brings me to one of my favorite theories about why there were giants after the flood. Right. One of my favorite theories is based off of the idea of a pundit square. Right. If you understand what a pundit square is, it's something that breaks down the difference between recessive and dominant traits. Now, I believe the Bible says or another source says maybe book Enoch. I don't remember the exact scripture for it, but another place says that all flesh was corrupted. So to me, I look at all flesh being corrupted as the bloodline leading through Adam and Seth and going its way up through Enoch and then finding its way to, you know, Jared, and then finding its way. I mean, uh, uh, Enoch, then Methuselah, then Jared, then Abraham, I mean, then Noah. Yes, it's Enoch, Methuselah, oldest man in history. Then Jared. Then Noah. And of course, some people see these as more archetypal figures, like these aren't the actual names. But I like I always say, treat Enochian mythology as if it's just mythology. It's just a way of having a way of looking at supernatural entities uh, sci-fi fantasy through a critical lens that can be seen through a biblical lens so it's like a biblical critical lens but it's through Enochian mythology which is expanded works from like the apocrypha things that are referenced to or seem to have parallels to the bible when it comes to like ancient aliens and I say you can also use it as just having a supernatural worldview in case there are some of these things that you don't think don't exist. Like later on, I'm going to be making a video about like uh, sirens and, and mermaids. Mommy water in the Marine Kingdom. Right. And all these things kind of tie together. But one thing that you'll see with the Book of Enoch. And I believe also the Book of Watchers is that the Nephilim were pretty much sent into civil war with each other, I believe, through the request of Michael. And during this civil war, they fought each other. But then they were also given this sentence that once they die, right, that their soul or their spirit would have no place to go. So it would be tied to this earth. Where the idea of familiar spirits and demons come from and ghosts, right? It's like the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim who were killed during the flood. Right? So that's one thing about it too. But when it comes to the Pundit Square Theory, right? The Pundit Square Theory. It's basically the idea that only Noah's bloodline directly was pure. Either Noah and his wife made three pure sons, right? Or only Noah and himself was pure and that his three sons had somewhat mixed genetics, but that their, their the, the wives of his sons had mixed genetics, right? So that's really probably my favorite theory when it comes to why there were giants after the flood. My favorite theory is probably that all flesh, to a certain extent, have been mixed with Nephilim DNA along the way. That the whole world had to be wiped out because of it. But that the wives of Noah's three sons 
Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And you know, Shem is where they come up with the term Shemetic or Semitic or Shemite. That's where Semitic comes from. It comes from the biblical person named Shem, right? Because you understand there's Shem, there's Japheth, and there's Cush. And there's different theories about where these people went to. The most clear of an example oftentimes is going to be seen in reference to Ham. Because Ham had uh, Cush, and then I believe Cush had Misraim. The Misraim became Egypt. And then uh, Ham had his son Cush, and I think Nimrod came afterwards. I, I got to double check. All this video is coming off the top of my head. But through the line is where you get these different Nephilims begin to pop out or these different hybrid creatures or these different hybrid humans to come out. And I think that there may be some connection between the idea of Cro-Magnum. I do personally believe that there have been a good bit of large skeletons that have been hid by, the, by a certain, uh, you know, I think it's an agenda. I think part of it goes along with certain, uh, what do you call those things? Museums? Maybe like the Smithsonian or something. Or maybe even at the Vatican, right? <coughs> but people with a lot of money who come in and buy certain things. So I believe we got that, right? But with the Pundit idea, it goes like this. The offshoot and the bloodline of Shem had the least amount of Nephilim in the bloodline. Until there was mixture later. Japheth had some, Right? And then Ham had the most. Like a lot of people find parallels between Nimrod, uh, Semiramis, and, Tor uh, and, and Tammuz, right? As like Isis, Osiris, and Horus, or a lot of the other depictions of that holy trinity or unholy trinity within other religious beliefs and indoctrinations. And one thing that you'll notice about Nimrod is that he's also compared to Gilgamesh from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the oldest known tablets of, of writings that there is. And within the Epic of Gilgamesh, I believe that's ancient Samaria, that with the Epic of Gilgamesh came this idea that Nimrod was two thirds God and one third man. So I think we also have to understand that a lot of things compared to a biblical scope would seem hyperbolic in its expression, but that there perhaps was a meaning to it that meant something, right? Like, let's say we're talking about being immortal, right? Now, the biblical equivalent of, or the Epic of Gilgamesh equivalent of the biblical Noah would be like Unapishtim, right? Now, Unapishtin in the Epic of Gilgamesh is seen to be immortal. Because keep in mind, he was like the last generation that was born before the flood. So his lifespan was greatly increased to be like 950 years, similar to, you know, similar to Adam, right? Same length of time. So for Noah and the people in his day and age like after the flood and you have to think he lived for hundreds of years after the flood that if ancient Sumerian Nimrod right uh, or Gilgamesh and his people saw Noah they would think he was immortal because he's lived through several of their generations of people who lived to be 120 years old right after the days were shortened so the Bible would see Noah as someone who lived to be 950 years old, who had a similar lifespan to that of his patriarchs, but to a society that may not be as exposed to that aspect of the narrative, they may just see Noah as, or Unapishtin, as being immortal. Right? I do think that is something to keep in mind. So, similarly, like, let's say we're talking about Greek mythology. Some, so some of the Greek gods may be more so akin to either watchers or first generation or second generation Nephilim. And the power that they possessed over humanity to wield the strength that they had. 
just like the Titans at times can be viewed as the the Anunnaki themselves or as the watchers because they're in Tartarus, right? It's the same word for the biblical narrative of Tartarus as it is for the Greek mythology narrative of Tartarus. Right? So that's something to keep in mind. But being that I'm speaking from Enochian mythology, I am going to speak from a perspective of breaking down this lore from a perspective of putting the Bible first and putting things that are adjacent to the Bible first as far as what I'm critiquing things by. So let's say that being two thirds God and one third man mean mean that he has a high concentration of Nephilim blood in him. You get what I'm saying? So when we're looking at it from that perspective, then let's say that we're still going through the pundit, uh, the pundit theory as to how giants existed after the flood. And then it would be just that the wives of Noah's sons, Ham, Shem and Japheth had a mixture of DNA and that just the way that the Poonin square works, there's dominant and recessive traits. Some people have brown eyes. Some people have blue eyes. If somebody has, you know, a child with somebody who has blue eyes when they have brown eyes, then most of the time it's going to be a brown eyed baby. But every once in a while, the recessive trait will come out and it will create a blue eyed baby. So if we're looking at it from that perspective, then let's say that maybe the grandfather of the wives of the, 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 the sons of Noah were Nephilim. And then that recessive trait kicked in after the flood to create a new generation of giants that eventually go towards Canaan, where they use the knowledge that they have of genetic splicing to create larger fruits to have grapes the size of a man's head right that they would use this advanced technology that they would have from you know maybe the spirits that would talk to them uh maybe it was the anunnaki maybe it was just traditions that were passed down and one thing that i believe when i talk about enochian mythology is the possibility of technology being greater in the days of noah than it was after that time and that things that we learn now anytime there is an extreme boost of knowledge i think that's one thing uh, correlated to the age of aquarius but once there's an extreme boost of knowledge right that takes place that within that extreme boost of knowledge there may be some otherworldly uh help right like one thing that you'll notice is that like, let's say we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah or we're talking about, I believe it's the Book of Watchers, right? Where they're talking about the war that took place uh, between the messengers of God or the angels that came to, uh, came with Enoch, right? To have that conversation with the Watchers about wanting to have a go between between them and God when they knew that they messed up. And I believe it was the Book of Watchers, but they assaulted and tried to fight the angels that came along with Enoch when he came back from one of his trips to heaven. Right. And that this was part of what sparked the very harsh judgment that they got from God when it came to what would happen to them, uh, what would happen to their children, their offspring. So one way of looking at it is like this, right? Let's say that when Gabriel and Michael or the archangels, they came to fight the watchers who tried to overtake the guarding angels who came with Enoch in the conversations that they were having, that when they tried to take over them, that the other Archangels came to fight them and during that fight they started dropping, you know, fire and brimstone from the sky. That sounds a lot like uh it sounds a lot like what happens during a nuclear war or an atomic bomb. 
So what if there is a possibility that some of the technology that comes with nuclear warfare may be inspired by interdimensional or extraterrestrial beings? Right. Let's say that we're looking at like a lot of monolithic structures and how we still today do not have the technology necessary in order to recreate those monolithic structures like the pyramids. Let's say that perhaps the Tower of Babel was meant to be a interdimensional stargate that was used to try and get into heaven. Right. Let's say that there's different ways of looking at these things and these structures like there's the wheels of fire. Right. There's biblically accurate angels. Right. And how they look like some super dimensional beings, interdimensional extraterrestrial structures that you wouldn't find outside of a DMT experience. So when we're talking about Enochian mythology, I think it's really dope to get into these topics. I think it's really dope to think about these particular things. And these are some of my theories and some of the theories about how giants were present after the flood. It's Coach Brody. I'm out.